Okay, um, hi everyone. Um, my name is Aram Segal from the Weizmann Institute. Um, I'm very great honor to uh, present uh, here today. I will uh, share my slides. Um, and so what I'll be talking to you, to, to you about today um, is uh, going to be mostly unpublished work uh, that we've been doing uh, in the past um, several years. Uh, in general, the lab is focused on um, work on personalized medicine, uh, where the emphasis is on uh, analysis of uh, molecular data and other types of physiological data connected to these types of measurements that, uh, uh, that, that we are profiling on human cohorts. Um, and uh, the first project that I will discuss is a large scale project that we started about uh, 10 years ago. The first part of it was published in uh, 2015. So I'll go over that uh, part briefly and tell you about uh, some other updates and then some follow up uh, projects. So uh, several years ago, uh, we were interested in uh, the problem of nutrition and trying to understand what healthy nutrition is, realizing that uh, this is um, a highly understudied field and definitely not uh, one in which uh, data was brought a lot into it. And so we initiated in Israel what we called the Personalized Nutrition Project. We recruited 1,000 participants. We connected them to a continuous glucose monitor, which measured their blood glucose levels every five minutes for the, the duration of uh, one week. And during that week, participants logged on, on a mobile app that we developed uh, all of their meals so that at the end of the study, we had blood glucose responses to about 50,000 meals where we look at the response in the two hours after a uh, person, um, uh, people eat their meal. Uh, the idea being that the response, uh, the blood sugar levels after a meal are highly relevant to weight management, to the development and progression of diabetes and to uh, several other diseases. And because this is published, I'll just summarize the three uh, key findings in the study. The first is that on a um, unprecedented scale of 1000 participants, we found that when different people eat exactly the same food, they have very different blood glucose responses. You can see here the, the similar responses of the same participant when um, he or she eats the same meal on two different days but how different participants uh, greatly differ in their responses. And, and this result demonstrated that um, at least as far as blood sugar levels go, our uh, meal responses have to be, our, our uh, nutrition has to be uh, personalized. Um, and um, the second key result that we had in this study was the development of uh, an algorithm that uh, we showed uh, could, um, uh, could predict these personalized blood glucose responses uh, in people. Um, and um, then we also performed a short week, short term uh, dietary intervention where uh, we showed that we can take participants who are even with prediabetes and we can balance their blood sugar levels fully with a diet that's identical in calories, but um, that has personally tailored meals for them, including uh, ice cream and chocolate on, on occasions. And so after completing this uh, study, uh, we and others asked what would be the long-term impact of following such diets on, on clinical parameters that we care about. And so we took this challenge upon ourselves and uh, we designed a randomized clinical trial and, and carried that out in the group. This was a uh, huge undertaking. We recruited 200 people with prediabetes and we randomized them into uh, either a standard of care arm as recommended by the American Dietary Association or um, in a diet based on our algorithms. And because these are people with prediabetes, we focused on uh, the effect that we have on blood sugar levels uh, in these people uh, following the intervention. The intervention lasted for six months, followed by another six months of uh, follow-up. And the primary outcomes were the average glucose levels as measured by the clinical parameter of hemoglobin A1C and as measured by continuous glucose monitors or CGMs that we connected to participants throughout the six months of the study. Uh, we also looked at our ability to reduce these spikes in glucose levels after meals uh, to reduce the time spent above some critical level of glucose uh, in the blood. So here's uh, anecdotally a single participant on the algorithm diet, this is the one month prior to the intervention. You can see a lot of spikes in glucose levels uh, reaching abnormally high levels, but following 
the first one month of intervention, we can see a major reduction in glucose levels, essentially eliminating all the spikes for this participant. And if we look across the entire uh, half year of the study, we can see um, that we virtually eliminated all of these uh, spikes, um, uh, almost all of them uh, throughout uh, the entire um, uh, six months of intervention. And if we summarize uh, all of these uh, results, then um, uh, you can see uh, you can see them here, um, where um, uh, uh, um, basically um, uh, basically you can see in red here the changes in hemoglobin A1C on the control diet. You can see a reduction after six months, but a reversal back to baseline levels after the next six months of follow-up on the CGM, we can see the reduction after six months and about a 30% reduction in the time spent above uh, 140. Uh, but in comparison, when we move to the algorithm diet, we see a major uh, reduction, even double the effect after six months. And what was nice for us to see is that this effect persisted in the next six months of follow-up. The reduction in terms of the spikes was 70% uh, compared to the 30%. And this was, um, 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 significantly better, of course, than the standard of care diet. So for us, this was um, very satisfying to uh, go from an idea that started somewhere in uh, 2011 up to completing a clinical trial in 2020. So nine years to go from an idea through the development of an algorithm and all the way to what we believe can be a treatment for people with prediabetes. And we've also recently completed a smaller trial in people with diabetes with uh, similar results. So we believe this can really be a therapeutic modality uh, for people with prediabetes or diabetes. Um, so um, besides, um, besides that, we've also uh, on the same cohort profiled uh, serum, uh, uh, profiled metabolite small molecules in the blood in the serum. And um, we asked a very fundamental question, which is what determines levels of small molecules or these metabolites in our bloodstream. And the reason why this question is uh, important is because a lot of the molecules that flow in our blood, they can reach throughout the system. They can reach many different parts of our body. And of course, uh, uh, by that, by that uh, these, many of these small molecules can actually have an effect on our health and disease. And so it would be uh, very important to understand which factors determine the levels and control the right levels of these metabolites, be them um, uh, dietary or microbiome factors, especially because these types of factors are factors that we can intervene in and change. And if you can intervene in these um, factors like the microbiome or the diet, then you might be able to alter them and by that modulate levels of different metabolites in the bloodstream and by that affect the health or disease of, of, particip of, of patients. Um, and so the metabolites that we measured using mass spectrometry uh, are very uh, um, prevalent, very abundant metabolites. We measured about 1,200 of them. 1,100 of them are found in 50% of people. They span a wide range of classes, including lipids, um, um, uh, amino acids, uh, xenobiotics, peptides, and so on. Interestingly, several hundreds of them are actually unknown metabolites, so metabolites that give a reproducible peak in the mass spec, but um, one that uh, uh, we don't know what the actual underlying metabolite is. And as the most stringent test for our ability to uh, say that we may have uncovered the features that determine these metabolites, we asked whether we can predict them in individuals uh, whose data we never saw before. So this is a standard machine learning approach where, for example, if we wanted to predict levels of caffeine, which is one of the metabolites that we measured from dietary data, we would build a matrix of dietary data in participants. We would take their levels of caffeine, choose our favorite algorithm. In our case, we used gradient boosting decision trees and uh, then take a subject whose uh, caffeine levels we never saw. We get his or her dietary data. We make a prediction and we compare it to the actual measurement. And when we do this for caffeine, we see that we actually get highly accurate uh, predictions explaining a large part of the variance in levels of caffeine uh, from dietary data. But of course, diet is just one of the features that we'd like to predict from, and, and caffeine is just one of the different metabolites that we had. So overall, 
we built over 13,000 machine learning algorithms for every pair of a metabolite and a group of features. And the group of features that we had included diet, microbiome, gender, time of day, anthropometric measurements, age, various cardiometabolic parameters, uh, food intake, uh, drugs, and, and so on. So um, first, kind of as a global view, what we found is that for over 90% of these metabolites, our models can actually explain a significant fraction of their vari variability in held out uh, data. Uh, of course, the amount of variability explained varied from one metabolite uh, to the other, but for 90%, there was a significant ability to make predictions. Um, if we ask which groups of features are actually driving the predictions and diet by far uh, was able to predict the largest number of metabolites, but in second place was uh, the microbiome that also uh, was the strongest predictor of several hundreds of different metabolites. Uh, we then assess the robustness of these predictions by collaborating with the group of Tim Spector from the UK, uh, who collected a similar sized cohort of coupled metagenomic and metabolomic samples. And we were very happy to see that when Tim sent us his metagenomic data and we ran our predictions and sent him back our uh, metabolite predictions and he compared those predictions to the actual metabolomic measurements which we never saw, we were very happy to see that if we um, look at the top metabolites, so metabolites that are best predicted on our data by the microbiome, then all of them actually achieved significant predictions on Tim's data despite the many differences in the microbiome of participants from Israel and participants from the UK, and uh, despite us never seeing uh, any metabolomic measurement uh, from these people. And even metabolites uh, that had only, only um, a few percentages of explained variants in our data, the majority of them uh, were even successfully replicated in uh, Tim's data. So this gave us a lot of confidence in really our ability to predict metabolite levels using only microbiome data based on the models that uh, we learned. Uh, we then wanted to kind of um, uh, look under the hood and see if we can identify the actual underlying features of the machine learning algorithms that we developed. So we used a, um, uh, a very recent um, uh, framework um, developed from um, Suin Lee's uh, group in uh, the University of Washington uh, called a SHAP uh, analysis, which basically takes a machine learning algorithm and, and distills the relative contribution of each of the different features to the actual prediction. So it basically tells you how you got uh, to a prediction, taking the, computing the marginal contribution of each feature while taking into account the contribution of all uh, other features. So it's a very useful feature attribution framework. And uh, using it, if we go to look at some positive controls, we can see that, for example, when we look at our predictions of caffeine, the driving feature of those predictions was self-reported uh, levels of drinking coffee, so a nice positive control. And similarly, in uh, two other metabolites, one uh, stachydrine and another uh, that's also a, um, um, uh, both of which are um, metabolites that are markers of either citrus fruit consumption or consumption of fish. We see that in both cases, uh, self-reporting eating of oranges or of fish uh, were the driving features in these predictions as um, would be expected. Uh, but this gives us confidence that we can now go and analyze predictions that we have less uh, um, uh, um, uh, prior uh, uh, knowledge about, uh, like predictions that come from the microbiome. And you can see here four predictions that worked um, extremely well in terms of the ability to accurately predict levels of metabolites using only microbiome data. And if we now apply the SHAP framework, we can now identify the bacteria that are really driving these predictions. And we think these results are highly important because they're a first step towards microbiome-based therapeutics because presumably if some of these metabolites are metabolites that we'd like to modulate and change in the bloodstream of participants, then the way to do that would be to intervene and alter levels of these specific bacteria uh, in individuals. Uh, and then finally, as proof of concept, we wanted to see whether some of these associations that we find uh, may actually be causal. So we uh, uh, took our dietary predictions um, in the case of uh, predictions for sourdough bread consumption. So we looked at metabolites that were 
um, predicted to either be negatively or, cor or positively correlated with uh, sourdough bread consumption. We recruited uh, a small cohort, 20 participants, into a randomized crossover trial where we gave them for one week sourdough bread and we profiled their metabolites before and after this sourdough bread consumption. And indeed, we saw that after one week of sourdough bread consumption, those metabolites that we predicted would be positively uh, um, uh, correlated with uh, sourdough bread consumption. Indeed, they increased uh, after one week of sourdough bread consumption. And this was quite specific because after giving the same participants white bread, we saw no significant change in these metabolites. Um, okay, so uh, moving on, I, I wanna tell you about another major effort that uh, we are doing in the space of microbiome and, and really a new way of analyzing microbiome data, which I believe will be the next frontier in, in how uh, we look at this, uh, these data. So as you may know, the way we uh, look at microbiome data at the moment is to take uh, stool samples, if we're looking at gut microbiome, um, process them into single short reads, and then uh, map them to a reference database and count how many bacteria and how many genes and pathways are represented in each sample. But of course, when we do this mapping, we have a lot more information. We actually know the individual letters, the individual nucleotides that map to each position. So really the underlying data that we have is for every bacteria at every given position, we know the variation in the base pairs across all individuals. Uh, this uh, overall matrix is, is of course very sparse because most people don't have uh, all bacteria, but uh, essentially this is a matrix of say a thousand bacteria times uh, 4 million positions per bacteria across all samples and you have the variation. And, and, and this has uh, a lot of different applications. We can, for example, um, uh, in analogy to genome-wide association studies that people do in human genetics, we can look at what we call metagenome-wide association studies or MWAS uh, to look at associations between variations now not in the human genome, but in individual positions across particular bacteria and see if that associates, uh, associates with various traits. Uh, we can look at transmission of bacteria between individuals and we can look at the evolution of bacteria uh, within a person across time. So I want to show you um, uh, very briefly some results with um, two of these different applications. The first is on uh, doing the association studies. Uh, of course, the idea to do this is quite straightforward, borrowing from the field of human genetics, but the reason this was not done until now is mainly due to lack of data. So if you look at the uh, development of uh, uh, availability of data sets in the human genetics field, we can see that uh, there's data sets that are now in the millions, mostly held by private companies. But in comparison, the microbiome field is lacking several years uh, behind uh, with cohorts uh, still being analyzed of dozens and hundreds of individuals. And it's very rare still to see cohorts of even um, a thousand or thousands of individuals. Uh, so we were lucky to collaborate with a microbiome uh, consumer company that has access to several tens of thousands of samples. By now it's even 60,000 samples. Uh, and so we could apply the, um, the method to, uh, to this data. And, um, and this is a uh, Manhattan, similar to a Manhattan plot that maybe you're used to seeing when you look at human genetic data, where basically all of the individual positions, the single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs that we analyzed 75 million uh, in total uh, are shown here on the x-axis and the y-axis shows the p-value of the association between that SNP and the actual trait uh, that we analyze. In this case, we're analyzing BMI. And in this case, we had close to 3,000 different species that uh, we analyzed and uh, over 60,000 of these uh, SNPs came out as being uh, significant, even after a very stringent Bonferroni correction for multiple hypothesis testing. Um, and, uh, but what is even more impressive than the actual p-values, which you can get if you have a large data set, is actually the size of the effect that we see for these uh, SNPs. So just to calibrate you, when people analyze human genetic studies, uh, I believe the strongest association for a single human SNP is about, uh, explains uh, statistically about 1.3 points of BMI, here we have several SNPs that um, actually explain, uh, even hundreds that explain uh, two or three points of BMI and some that explain even four or five points of BMI. That, that's a lot. 
uh, translated to kilograms of body weight, depending on the height of a person, this can amount to 15, 20, or 25 kilograms of uh, body weight. So, so it really statistically explains a lot. And here's, um, here's an example. So here's a single SNP, just one position in a particular bacteria. And you can see that the average BMI of participants that um, have the major allele, um, uh, the 18,000 that have the major allele, their average BMI is about uh, 27. Whereas those um, 500 individuals that have the minor allele, their BMI is on average 31. So a four point uh, difference in BMI where all the difference between these participants is this single letter that changes in a particular position. So of course, we're not claiming that this is causal, but this is really very strong, uh, uh, a very strong association. And um, we discovered these associations on the Israeli court and we then compared them to the court that we had from the US and 100% of the associations when they were significant in the US, the direction and the coefficient of um, their uh, uh, association was in the same direction as was on the Israeli court. So we think a very nice validation for, uh, for these uh, SNPs. Um, the other um, uh, uh, interesting thing in this type of analysis that we do for, uh, for SNPs that we don't have in the human genome is that because we're looking at many different bacteria and because uh, genes have different instantiations in different bacteria, we can actually analyze what happens to variation in the same type of gene across many bacteria. And this is kind of an independent test. So in this case, in the case of the uh, beta galactosidase uh, gene, which is a gene that uh, breaks down complex carbohydrates, um, we found that in 43 different genes in 43 different bacteria, variation in this gene was significantly associated with BMI, which may make sense if it's a gene involved in a breakdown of um, complex carbohydrates, it may have a role in, um, in BMI, uh, but it's a nice independent validation to see this result coming up over and over again across different instantiations of, uh, of this gene. We can zoom in even further and see where in this gene we see the variation and really go, go in very deep and, and study and try to hypothesize whether these variations actually may have a causal role. Um, here are associations with age, also 75 million SNPs analyzed, in this case, 150,000 coming up as significant after Bonferroni correction. And again, the effect sizes are really huge. Statistically, some of them explain even more than 10 years of age difference. Here's a uh, particular example. Uh, 1,400 individuals with the minor allele have an average age of uh, 66, whereas the average age of the 16,000 that have the major allele is uh, around 55. So really about a 10-year difference with just a single SNP. Here's, um, uh, again, we analyze um, uh, at the gene level and we find here that the uh, 59 copies of the DNA gyrase A gene actually have variation that's associated with age. Uh, this gene is actually a well-known target of uh, antibiotics, so it confers antibiotic resistance. And indeed, we see that um, the variation that we have is actually in the same position. And so um, we hypothesize that here, maybe we've understood, uh, we've, we've uh, uncovered the mechanism and maybe it's related to the fact that um, older people have taken either recently or throughout their lifetime more antibiotics, which caused a change in this particular position to confer antibiotic resistance. And in fact, in in vitro studies, uh, people have shown that variation in this particular position actually does confer antibiotic resistance. And so it's kind of a marker for these people uh, taking more antibiotics either recently or throughout their lifetime. Um, and overall, we can uh, summarize all of the associations in terms of the classes of different uh, functions and genes that come up as being significant. And, and we think really this is bringing us much closer to a mechanistic understanding of um, the effects of the microbiome on health and disease. Uh, finally, in the last few minutes that I have, I want to share with you uh, another type of uh, study that uh, uh, different application of this uh, method to look at transmission of strains. This one we did in the context of a disease, atopic dermatitis. This is a multifactorial disease, very prevalent in about 20% of children, 10% of adults. Um, and so we wanted to ask whether 
altering the microbiome by fecal microbiome transplants actually can have an effect on um, uh, clinical outcomes in, in, people, in these patients. So we designed a study where uh, each person was his own control. Uh, that person was given uh, two doses of capsules, uh, first with no fecal matter, so placebo, and then followed by four dosings of uh, fecal material separated by two weeks each. And first, uh, you can see the clinical effects. So here's a participant uh, before the actual fecal transplantation, so after the uh, placebo, and four weeks later, after two dosings of um, the actual fecal material, we can see a major reduction in clinical symptoms. Here's another patient, and even many weeks after the last FMT was performed, this patient maintains a huge reduction in clinical symptoms. If we score this according to the commonly used score of um, uh, um, clinicians, what's called the score ad, we can see about a 70% reduction on average after the courses of uh, FMT, not any reduction after the actual placebos. Um, the amount of improvement varies by person, but in all 100% of patients, uh, we saw significant improvements and our, our clinicians tell us that these are even bigger improvements than what they typically see after um, treating with uh, commonly available drugs today. So of course we were interested to understand what's going on under the hood in terms of the microbiome. So we first analyzed our baseline samples and we looked at the average distance between um, different strains. We're now using the SNP analysis, we can look across the entire genome and uh, we see a typical distance of about 1% uh, or 0.1% uh, differences across all of the base pairs in the genome between different people. Uh, in dots here are distances between a donor and his patient. And because uh, these are baseline samples, we haven't done anything, we, we see that the dots fall right in the box plots as if the um, donor and the participant are unrelated, which they are at the baseline. Uh, after the placebo, we see essentially the same picture, but after the FMT, we see that a lot of the dots now move to showing essentially no difference across the genome between the donor and the patient, indica indicating that really a transmission of the strain has occurred. Uh, we, can, we can see this uh, uh, picture side by side. And if we look, we see that actually there were several strains that uh, passed from multiple donors uh, to, uh, to almost all of the participants here, the top Prevotella copri uh, bacteria was transferred and transmitted to uh, seven of the eight patients that uh, were tested here. And finally, uh, we can also ask uh, what global changes, if any, this uh, FMT does to the microbiome. And we can put on a um, TSNI analysis, uh, reduce the dimensions of the microbiome data. We can see here in an ellipses, are all the samples of the three different donors that we had. Squares represented based on the samples of uh, participants. You can see that there's no relation now between the donor and his um, recipients. After the placebo, there's really no movement of the patients, but after we start the FMT, we see a major global change in the recipients, and now their microbiome becomes much more similar to their donor, and we see this in almost every case of a um, transplantation from the, um, from the donor to, uh, to the patient. Um, so um, I am out of time. I wanted to um, uh, tell you about some work that we've done in COVID. I'll just mention that we developed a model uh, that predicts um, uh, uh, critically ill patients uh, in hospitals uh, based, on, uh, based on data that we collected in Israel. Uh, where the idea is to uh, model the transitions between identifying positive cases in hospitalization and, and, and either the release or death from that results from hospitalizations. And these models were, um, were employed by um, government officials and policymakers to, to reach decisions throughout the pandemic. We provided these predictions ahead of time one week um, on, on Twitter and, and actually they were quite accurate in predicting the amount, the number of critically ill patients that we will have one or two weeks uh, going forward. Um, and with that, I will put up the slides of the acknowledgements, our list of uh, many, many different uh, collaborators.
and uh, the many students uh, in my group that really contributed to all of these uh, different projects. And with that, I will thank you very much for uh, your attention.